Good morning. We believe within the person of Jesus Christ, there are two natures, the divine nature and the human nature. Scripture teaches he is fully divine and fully human. His divinity is on display in passage that describe him as being equal for, with God. The New Testament also points to the deity of Christ by showing how he possessed attributes that God alone possesses. How he performs works that only God performs, and how he himself claims to be the Son of God. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning, with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of man. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light, that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but he came to bear witness about the light. The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him. Yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who received him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, not of will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh, and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, Glory as of his only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for giving us another day to worship together. Please help to us to recognize areas of our life that need to change and need to be pointed more towards you. Thank you for giving us our, your Son, and please help us over our hearts to listen to what we hear today. Amen. Amen. Let's all stand as we sing. We bow down. Good person out of the good treasure of his heart produces good, 
And the evil person, out of his evil treasure, produces evil. For out of the abundance of the heart, his mouth speaks. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I tell you? Everyone who comes to me and hears my words and does them, I will show you what he is like. He is like a man building a house who dug deep and laid the foundation on the rock. And when a flood arose, the stream broke against that house and could not shake it because it had been built, it had been well built. But the one who hears and does not do them is like a man who built a house on the ground without a foundation. When the stream broke against it, immediately it fell, and the ruin of that house was great. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we do not need to hear your audible voice to know what we should do. We do not have to have visions or dreams to know what you want us to do. Father, you have given us your word. Many times we don't read your word to try to find out what we should do. Many times we do read and know it, but we ignore it. We do not do all of what you and what Christ commands. Father, for that... We repent, and I pray, Father, you would just give us a greater desire to uh, learn and know and read and hear your word and to do it. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Great is the weight of our sin. Great is the release that comes with the forgiveness of our sin. Paul wrote to us in Romans, For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. For the scripture says, Everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. O Christian who believes in Christ, he has justified you. He has washed you, and you will not be put to shame. Crown him with many crowns, many stains.
35 to 38. The harvest is plentiful, the laborers are few. And Jesus went throughout all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plenty, plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Today, Southern Baptists all around our convention are focusing on WMU, Women's Missionary Union, and all that they do for the local churches. One of the things we do is pray for our missionaries on their birthday. Our missionaries have told us that they wait to do a very hard or difficult task until their birthday because they know that many Southern Baptists are lifting them up in prayer on that special day. I believe in your bulletin there are missionaries who uh, have birthdays today. Uh, some are internationals, some are North American missionaries. If you would look at that, uh, uh, please pray for them. Look at that list as, as we all go to the Lord in prayer right now. May we pray. Dear Lord, I first um, want to pray for our national WMU leaders to make wise decisions while remembering the great legacy of those who came before us to lead in mission work and keep missions in the forefront of our Baptist heritage. I pray for the state and local WMUs to grow and continue to champion the cause of missions. I pray for our North American and international missionaries, past, present, and future, both active and retired, and even those who are waiting patiently for doors to open after COVID, that you would meet their needs as they work tirelessly to spread the good news of Jesus' birth, his death, and his resurrection. Keep them safe from harm as they serve those around them. And for all those having birthdays today, we know that uh, their hearts are wondering if we're praying, and, and we just want to let them know with all of our heart that we are praying for them, that when they are doing something a difficult to task that they've waited just for today to do, that they might re uh, receive the encouragement that is there and, and, and help from you as, as they know we're praying. Thank you for the missionaries that we have known personally throughout the years, like uh, Ted and Pat Cox, who were missionaries in Japan, or Dale and Dolores Maddox, uh, they've worked in Montana, and Mark and Vesta Sauer, who worked with the deaf peoples in Europe, and the Scott family from Oak Hill Baptist who are waiting for mission to serve in Japan even as we speak and pray today. And many, many others, dear Lord, we, we lift them up to you. May we faithfully uh, hold the ropes of prayer for these servants in our prayers and in our giving. You've told us in our Matthew passage to pray earnestly to you, the Lord of the harvest, to send out laborers into the harvest. So, Father, if there's one here today whose heart desires to follow you wherever you send them, that they might surrender their will to yours and serve you faithfully. Be with us through the rest of the service as we sing and praise the power of your holy name. Amen. Amen. May we stand and sing together. Amen.
Will you pray with me this morning? Gracious Heavenly Father, as we turn our attention now to the pages of Scripture, to focus in on what is being revealed to us in the words that John wrote. It is my prayer, Father, that you would help us to <coughs> humble ourselves, to recognize not just what Jesus did for us, but who he is. And may our worship flow from the realization that Christ died for us. But we pray this in his name and for his name's sake. Amen. Amen. If you would, grab a Bible and join with me in John chapter 18. Can I just say that it feels really, really good to say that? Um, while, while I think it's important that every once in a while we have series to focus on certain topics in the church life and all of that, um, I love just preaching through the books. Uh, of just starting, we are picking up once again in John, and uh, while we've been in this book for a couple of years now, um, hang with me, we've got three more months to go and, and then we will have completed John and if you want to know where we are going next um, I don't know either uh, I've got a couple of ideas but I haven't decided on one yet so uh, be praying for me as we continue to look at that John chapter 18 just to kind of remind you since you may have slept since we were last in John uh, what has just happened in John chapter 17 is Jesus was in the garden and he was praying for his disciples. He was praying for them and praying for us. And at the end of 17 was the closing of that prayer. So where we pick up today is now what he did following praying for us. John chapter 18. When Jesus had spoken these words, he went out with his disciples across the Kidron Valley, where there was a garden, which he and his disciples entered. Now Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place, for Jesus often met there with his disciples. So Judas, having procured a band of soldiers and some officers from the chief priests and the Pharisees, went there with lanterns and torches and weapons. Then Jesus knowing all that would happen to him, came forward and said to them, Whom do you seek? They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said to them, I am he. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them. When Jesus said to them, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. So he asked them again, Whom do you seek? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I told you that I am he. So if you seek me, let these men go. This was to fulfill the word he had spoken. Of those whom you gave me, I have lost not one. Then Simon Peter having the sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. So Jesus said to Peter, Put your sword into its sheath. Shall I not drink the cup that the Father has given me? Also reading verse 12. So the band of soldiers and their captain and the officers of the Jews arrested Jesus and bound him. Now, I imagine if you have a visual picture of what the arrest of Jesus looked like, it probably looks different from what I just read to you. Because most of us have the Matthew, Mark, and Luke version of the arrest more ingrained in our minds than we do the John version of the arrest. You probably imagine when you picture it, Judas walking up with a bunch of people and Judas going and kissing Jesus. And then the officers coming in, 
grabbing Jesus and then some of the stuff that we see in here. And you're wondering, now, wait a minute. If Judas identified Jesus, why is it that they're having to call? What's happening? And, and you're trying to fit all of the details together. And that might lead some of you to begin to question Scripture. Right? If, if one story tells one thing and another account says something different, you're like, well, who is right? And I want to deal with that for just a moment because you're going to come across that a lot through the rest of John because the reality is most of us have the Matthew, Mark, and Luke version of what follows in these events ingrained in our head. And John keeps throwing in details and leaving out some of those things and you just think, what's happening here? You can tell the same story, giving only true facts, but have different purposes that you tell the story with, so you include different details. Like Matthew, he's writing so that the Jews will understand things. Mark is writing to get the details out to start the conversation to make you ask, well, who is Jesus? Luke is trying to write things in the order that they happen mostly and include other factual details to help you look up to make sure that this is real. John is concerned with you knowing that Jesus is God. Yes. So each one of them include the details of the story that help them get their overall narrative together. For example, some of you may have known, this is going to go over some of your, your heads, so for those of you who don't care about what I'm about, just try to understand the point. Last week, there was a big game that was televised. Right. Now, I can tell two different stories about that game. Don't worry, I'm going to go fast, so don't clear out of your vocal ball. Don't turn on. All right. I could say, last week there was a really good football game that was a back-and-forth game that came down to the last two minutes of the game to determine the winner. Now, that is a true and factual story. And when you hear that, you're like, oh, wow, that was a great game. Or, I could say, Last week, there was a game, and the official showed up at the wrong time. <laughs> the biggest play that Cincinnati had happened because no flag was thrown when a receiver tried to rip a guy's head off. And then another time, a Cincinnati player breathed on a guy funny, and they threw a flag on that one at a key moment in the game, which gave the Rams the game. Both of those are true stories. But with one, I'm trying to make sure that you understand it was a good game. And in the other, I'm trying to let you know, you know what, there were problems even with the good game. Both are true, but include different details of the game to help you understand the big picture. That's what we see here in John. Right? So as we look at this, let's go through and see what some of those details are those weird things that John has included to help us to understand John's big point that he wants us to know. So we start out, Jesus has prayed, he goes out into the Kidron Valley, and there's a garden there. And most of you are going, well, yeah, doesn't Jesus pray? Yes, but John's not worried about that detail. He just gave a whole chapter of one of Jesus' prayers. He thinks you already know that Jesus was a prayer. He's focused on another point now. So he's going to this, the Garden of Gethsemane, but it doesn't say that here. Guess where the Garden of Gethsemane is? It's in the Kitchen Valley. See, giving details. He's there with his disciples, verse 2. Now Judas, who betrayed him, remember, he's already left and he's already got the crowd. As far as John goes, whenever he brings up Judas, he wants to point out, this is the betrayer. We don't like this guy. So Judas knew the place. Well, how did Judas know the place? Because Jesus often went there. Already, John is starting to set up the whole main point of giving this arrest scene. Judas knew Jesus like the Garden of Gethsemane. If Jesus knew they were looking to arrest him, if he was like any one of us same people, that's the last place to go. I'm a fan of true crime stuff. When the people know they're about to get arrested, they run. They don't 
just go home and hang out and say, well, we'll see if they figure out I'm here. Of course they know. So Jesus, if he often goes here with his disciples, if he's not wanting to be arrested, should go to the other part of town. No. Jesus knows everything that would happen. Look at verse 4. Then Jesus, knowing all that would happen to him, came forward. So if you're trying to balance the whole kiss thing going on here, all right? Judas, here's Jesus. He's told his disciples, we know from the other one, rise, the hour is at hand. So now here's Jesus with the disciples. They, they're coming up, they're gathering around him. Judas comes and beelines right for Jesus and kisses him. Now all of the guards know who Jesus is. And according to the other accounts, Jesus knows he's being betrayed with a kiss. Judas with a kiss would be betrayed. <laughs> he knows that's the symbol. And yet still, with the benefit of all of the guards and stuff, Jesus comes forward and says, who are you looking for? If you are the guilty one that's about to be arrested, you step back into the crowd and let all of the crowd say, I am Spartacus. No, I am Spartacus. I am. Right? But Jesus doesn't hold back in the crowd. Jesus steps forward and says, who are you looking for? He walks towards suffering. He walks towards arrest. He moves forward and they answer Jesus of Nazareth. Now, we say that with a respect, with an honor. That is not how they would have pronounced it. They are looking for Jesus of Nazareth. That nothing tell. And Jesus responds and our scriptures say, I am he. But can I tell you that you don't need that word he there. We need it for English, but Jesus didn't add in an extra he. Jesus said two words there. Ego e me. Now if you can remember over the last two years, or if this is your first time here, let me let you know that throughout John there have been seven different instances where Jesus has thrown out this combinations of words, ego e me, which you don't need the ego, you can just say e me, and it means I am, but it's emphatic, I, I am. And Jesus used it seven times. He said, I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the door of the sheep. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the good shepherd. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the true vine. And now he puts no other qualifier on it. He simply says, I am. And at the pronunciation of his name, as he steps forward saying, I am, Trained guards that are there with the purpose of grabbing him and taking him into custody step back and fall down to the ground at the pronunciation of the divine name coming from the lips of Jesus Christ. Amen. There is no doubt that what he is saying here. I am. I know what's going to happen because I am. This is my father's plan. This was the reason I was born of a virgin. This is the reason I have lived a sinless life. This is the reason I have spoken the truth to everyone who's ever listened to me. This is why I am here, because I am. The cards fall back. They're on the ground. And I wish I knew. I've struggled with this all week, but... Jesus then does something. I can't figure out why he does it. So if you know, come and talk to me afterwards. While they're down on the ground and having fallen back, he again says, who are you looking for? Now, if I put myself in the shoes of the guards, part of me is going, nobody. Uh-uh. But they repeat, 
Jesus of Nazareth. And he repeats his name. I told you. And again, the construction is there. Echo E B. But this time, instead of just standing on his divinity, he does something that's characteristically Jesus. So if you seek me, let these men go. Now think. Again, picture the story. We're told that the guards, that the officers, that the officials have come with lanterns and torches and weapons. And I don't know who first said it, but it's been ingrained in my mind the great irony that they come with torches, lanterns, and weapons to arrest the light of the world and the Prince of Peace. A proper lynching coming at night. Torches in hand, weapons in hand, ready to, by force, put this man under arrest. Knowing that the cross is hours away, Jesus once again says, take me, leave them. You're not here for them, you're here for me. Do you understand that Jesus was interceding for his disciples there in that moment? And you'll notice, even though one of those disciples cuts the ear off of a man, they don't lay a hand on any of them. Though those disciples were guilty then, literally had blood on their hands, none of them get taken. Do you know why? Because when Jesus intercedes for you, nothing can touch you. Amen. But I'm guilty. It doesn't matter. Your guilt's about to be thrown on Jesus Christ because he intercedes for his own. It doesn't matter how bad the circumstance was for him. He's always interceding for you and me. This is the God that we serve. Interceding for us even when we are guilty. Now notice here. When he speaks this, look at verse 9, the, the reason John gives us for why Jesus defended the disciples. It says, this was to fulfill the word that he had spoken, of those whom you gave me, I have lost not one. Now, when did he speak those? He did it back in chapter 17. The prayer, right before all of this, he said, I have not lost any that you've given me except for the son of perdition, meaning Judas. And now he's fulfilling those words, and John is highlighting that Jesus is fulfilling his words. Now that's, in and of itself, that's amazing. But when you compare this story to the Matthew and Mark version of the story, Matthew and Mark, they make a different highlight. When Matthew and Mark talk about all of this taking place, they talk about it happening to fulfill Scripture, meaning the Old Testament. When John talks about things being fulfilled, he's talking about the words of Jesus. So do you see, in the arrest, the, all the gospel writer's concern is that the words of God are being fulfilled, whether they were written by prophets or whether they're coming from the word of God himself. Yes. John chapter 1, in the beginning was the word. John is begging for us to put all of this together to realize that the very person of God in flesh was willingly being arrested. Because we sinned. Now think over your last week. Think about the times that you have spent in repentance before God. Were you broken by your sin? 
Or have you grown so used to asking God to forgive you that it's as if it's nothing to you anymore? Too many times in growing up, I, I know I, I was taught this prayer, and so I prayed it every night because I thought it's just what I was supposed to pray. And, you know, Lord, forgive me of my sins and those sins that I can't think about. Forgive me of those. And then, I, and then Lord, I, I really want Donkey Kong on, on the Atari 2600. Uh -huh. I could move so quickly from saying, Lord, forgive me to give me, that I really had zero concept of the weight of my sin and the offense it was to a holy God. And yet here Jesus is looking at the full consequence, looking at how he was about to be beaten, looking at how he was about to be spit upon, looking at how he was going to be physically nailed to a cross and hung there for hours for people to mock and wag their tongues at, to experience sin for the first time ever since before there was no time. And yet he did it willingly because this last week I sinned. When we think of the immensity of the person who went to the cross, we cannot see sin as a small thing. And unless we think about the divinity of Jesus Christ willingly walking to a cross, we will never rightly come before the Holy God saying, have mercy on me, a sinner. Then Simon Peter, here we go, Simon. By the way, John's the only one that points out that it was Simon Peter. Matthew, Mark, and Luke just say one of the disciples. John throws Peter under the bus all the time. You're going to see that in the next few months. Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it in the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. Now, notice that John here doesn't point out that Jesus healed the ear. Oddly enough, Luke, who was a doctor, was the only one that pointed out this healing. The rest just leave his ear off. John gives us his name. That's how we know it's Malchus. Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it, struck the high priest's servant, cut off his right ear. Look at verse 11. So Jesus said to Peter, put your sword into its sheath. Shall I not drink the cup that the Father has given me? And Jesus knew how deep that cup was. Jesus knew the depth of the cup of God's wrath that is pictured for us in Revelation. Jesus knew what he was about to be forced to drink. And when Peter was trying to get Jesus out of it, Probably still trying to prove to Jesus, see, I'm never going to deny you. By the way, denial coming up pretty quick. Jesus takes Peter and says, Peter, put that sword away. It's not time for that. Right now it's time for me, the I am, to drink the cup the Father has prepared. <clears throat> Understand how graciously Jesus did all of this for you? Before you had done anything right, Jesus did this for you. And again, even in this statement, even as we look and see Jesus calling himself the I Am, and Jesus healing here in this moment, here about to be bound. John is making a reference back to an Old Testament verse. It just so happens to be in Deuteronomy. In Deuteronomy chapter 32, 39, God is speaking and God says, See now that I, even I, am He. And there is no God beside me. I kill and I make alive. I wound and I heal, and there is none 
that can deliver out of my hand. Amen. Do you see that Jesus is the same? I am he. With the word, Jesus could have struck them all down. And yet with his death, he made every one of us who believe alive. Amen. Though we are wounded and sick and weak, Jesus alone can make us healed and restored and strong. And when we are in Jesus' hand, neither life nor death nor principality nor things above nor things below will be able to pull us out of his hand. Nothing can. If that's only true, if he truly is the incarnate God walking in the flesh. He heals the guilty. Now, the time for the sword will come. This hour is the hour where Jesus himself is going to the cross on your behalf, on my behalf, on the behalf of, of the world. That he would die for our sins and be buried and ultimately raised again on the third day. That's this hour. But the reality is for all of us to know that the hour when the sword will be used on the unjust is still to come. And none of us need to see that day to receive that sword because by trusting in Christ, he bears that sword for us. That we might be spared the judgment of God that all of our sins be washed clean. Oh, our sins be as scarlet. We will be as white as snow. All of this is made possible by our faith in what Jesus Christ is accomplishing here. Amen. Peter need not bring his sword. God himself will bring it when the day comes. Yes. And when I was putting this together, originally I was going to stop at 11, but I couldn't stop laughing at verse 12. So the band of soldiers, now, he, he left out, I'm going to read it like John wrote it, and then I'm going to put the, the Steve Taylor sarcastic spin on it. So the band of soldiers and their captain and the officers of the Jews arrested Jesus and bound him. In and of itself, that's just funny, guys. All right? That, I mean, here's the guy who's volunteered himself, and they still tie him up as if he's running away. But I can't help adding a couple. You're not so far. Don't add words to scripture. But if I could. So the band of soldiers and their captain and the officers of the Jews picked themselves up off the ground. It doesn't say it, but we know at some point they had to do it, right? Unless Jesus being Jesus was the one to help them out. I don't know. I wasn't there. I didn't see it. They thought they were in control. Don't we? We look at our lives and think we've got it all together. We have some good days and we think, man, I'm really crushing it right now. We, we get it right once and yeah. We think we've got everything under our own control. Until God himself steps forward and reminds us who really is in control of the situation. Amen. So I look out here, I, I see people that I know and that I love, and I see the things that you are going through in your lives, and it's very, I mean, all kinds of different things you guys are going through. Such that I don't even know the depth and the reality of all of them. I can say the same thing that's true to each and every one of you here today without fear of being wrong have two great truths for you in this. Jesus knows exactly what you are going through. Yes. He knows exactly what's down the road. And he's still in control. Yes. Amen. Trust him with your today. 
Trust Him with your tomorrow. And trust Him for your eternal life. Amen. Hey, Mike. Will you pray with me? Gracious Heavenly Father, thank you for showing us our Savior. Thank you for showing us that while Jesus was a man in the flesh who needed to eat, who needed to sleep, who grew tired, was also rightly able to say, I am. Yet he did not hold that right in such a way that he would change what he was doing. The Father, that he still willingly went to the cross. That my sinful self, that our sinful selves might be forgiven through his death, burial, and resurrection. Father, I pray that you would help us to remember that this week and to worship him rightly in the way that we live and even in our repentance. For I pray this in his name. Amen. Amen. The scripture tells us this. And when Jesus said, I am he, they drew back and they fell to the ground. It also reminds us that one day, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. So as we sing this song, can I encourage you to not wait until that day, but to surrender right now to the Lord of all creation? And if you've never publicly acknowledged Jesus Christ as Lord, while we sing this song, Will you surrender your right to be in control to the one who really is? Amen. Let's stand together as we say.
You know, here's the good news that we have. The one that we surrender to is the one who loves you more than you love yourself. He's the perfect one to surrender to. The God of all creation, your creator, gave his life for you. Let's receive the benediction together. <coughs> Almighty God, maker of heaven and earth, we thank you for sending your son to us, for helping us to see who he is, and that he was willing to love us to the point of dying for us. Help us to live in light of that truth. And now as we leave this place, Father, guard our hearts and our minds by granting us your peace. Amen. Amen.